Dr. Dilip Rata, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Now, I must admit that when I saw how large remittances are globally, I was shocked. It's bigger than foreign direct investment and even foreign aid combined. How did it get so big? What you notice over the last uh, 20 years or even longer is that uh, the flow of remittances have steadily increased and uh, they continue to increase. Whereas foreign direct investment is motivated by profits. So if the recipient economies are not doing that well, then foreign direct investment does not flow or sometimes even reverses. Uh, remittances flow more when the families back home, the countries back home are not doing that well. So it's a very interesting process of migrants helping their families who had helped them to migrate. You see, when uh, normally there is a poor family and there is a huge benefit if the family somehow manages to support one of their people, perhaps the most able person who has the strongest chance of getting a job abroad and send them to a destination, for example, from Philippines to Singapore. You know, uh, the richer the destination country, the larger the benefit of migration purely in terms of income gains, and that person then goes there, works there, and then sends money home, it might be as little as sometimes 20% of the income, sometimes 50% of the income, but that is so much more than what the person would have earned back home. If there is a natural disaster, earthquake, hurricane, flooding, migrant sends more money home. So remittances are almost like an insurance for families that probably don't have insurance to start with. A most uh, both sad as well as incredible thing, the way that the, the world works. The amounts that people send can though be very small. Usually, in fact, they're only sending about a few hundred dollars uh, every week. Isn't that so? Absolutely. It's actually the average amount of remittances globally might be even below 200 now. Of course, if you think about richer countries, let's say Mexico, where the per capita income, which also is an indicator of the cost of living there, is more like ten, twelve thousand dollars a year. There, if you if you send two hundred dollars, the family is not going to uh, do that well. So you would expect people to send migrants from Mexico to send to their families more like three hundred seventy, four hundred dollars. Whereas if you are thinking about Nepalese migrants from Qatar sending money to Kathmandu or to to Nepal. The cost of living there is much lower. And so they would send more like a, you know, $200 per month. So it's like average of $200 per month. That's the sort of amount that is being sent. And uh, incredibly, because there are 281 million migrants, out of which somewhere around 180 million people probably send money home regularly, it adds up to, the small amounts add up to huge amounts of flow of money. And uh, the surprise to us has been last couple of years. When everything was falling in 2020, remittances did not fall as much. They fell in many parts and particularly in Africa and Europe and Central Asia. We saw a decline of about 1.7%. 1.7% when foreign direct investment fell by 30%. And then 2021, 
it is remarkable that remittances have continued to grow back at the rate of 7% or so. And if you look at Latin America and the Caribbean region, and in particular to Mexico, remittances have grown 25%. Egypt, there is a growth of more than 20%. Morocco, more than 20%. Pakistan, Bangladesh, all over. Amazing. But that's amazing because didn't we go through a whole series of lockdowns due to COVID and people didn't have jobs? How come they were still able to send money home? So that is the remarkable part. There was an immediate impact, let's say in April, May, June last year, particularly in April. The shock effect of the lockdowns, businesses shut up, people staying at home. And you know when there is a crisis like that, foreign workers, they suffer more unemployment than native workers, always. So a lot of people immediately could not even go out to send money, even if they had the money. And they know that the family back home needs it because it was a global crisis. So there was actually a, a serious decline, deep decline in remittance flows in April, May, June of 2020. And then the fiscal stimulus programs that governments were able to put in place fairly quickly, those uh, programs began to have impact and larger than expected impacts. So there was a faster recovery, partial recovery, gradual recovery, but faster recovery from the depth of the crisis of second quarter 2020. And that translated into uh, foreign workers working more. Uh, perhaps they were not getting as paid as much as before, but because they are very much there to support families and the family back home needs so much more money, they sent more money home by cutting costs, working more, sharing accommodation to cut on rents, and then keep sending money home. And So they made process, more sacrifices in order to be able to send more money home? Yes, yes. So they kept sending more money home, and that is why we began to see a recovery in remittance flows. Are remittances good or bad? Do some countries just get stuck being dependent on remittances? The answer unequivocally is that remittances are good. Remittances good. are good for the people. And uh, I think one has to immediately recognize, and, and I can't emphasize this more, that remittances are people's own way, households, families' own way of making a living and surviving. And, you know, if the situation where they are in their, in their community uh, is not conducive to earning money and having a decent life, that's when people want to move. Migration is an exception rather than the rule. You see 281 million people in the world who are migrants. That's only what, less than 3%, around 3% of the world population. 97% of the people in the world do not move around nine out of 10 migrants and refugees in the world are economic migrants. What that means is that a person is moving to find a job and there is an employer who gives a job and then only that person stays there. If that person doesn't get the job, then moves on or moves back. So that arrangement of a person looking for a job, another person hiring the person, is a win-win arrangement. So nobody loses, everybody gains, but, right? But the employment conditions can be pretty terrible as well. They can be incredibly abused. They may not have rights. Some of them don't even get paid. That doesn't sound like a win-win. No, it is, it is still a win-win, uh, but you are right. There are abuses of uh, employers taking advantage of uh, uh, migrants who do not have rights who may not have, may not have the recourse to go to complain. 
uh, and who are there just to put up with it because they care for their family so much more than, uh, than the abuse that they suffer, right? It provides escape to people from poverty. The birth weight of children is larger in families that receive remittances than in other families in Sri Lanka and in El Salvador. Education, we know that school dropout ratio among remittance recipient families is lower than in other families. So these are statistics that go on support the same point that it is a, the family taking care of itself through the means of remittances. So remittances are dollars with care. How do we make sure that those that they have, that the host countries provide decent conditions? What is the way to incentivize the host countries to actually pay them respectively, pay them at all sometimes, uh, and to make sure that they have decent conditions? The construction worker pays sometimes three years, two years, we're talking about 24 months, 36 months. I have seen cases of 72 months of expected wages as upfront fees to labor agents. I belabor this point a little bit just to, just to bring about the importance of bringing down the recruitment costs that are paid by workers. So that's what countries can do. That's one of the crucial things they can do. The country, the, the host country can try and make sure that the recruitment costs aren't outrageous. Host country, meaning that the country that would receive the migrants and in collaboration with origin countries who would also regulate the recruitment agency, give them proper guidelines, go after smugglers, the modern day slavers. Also, they need to educate the migrant workers. Uh, they need to educate also the employers. And then maybe there is a role for the embassies of the origin countries in the host countries for migrants. They can play a bigger role in terms of watching out for the rights of their workers. There's a huge role for policy to mitigate these negative impacts of migration. But can remittances make governments lazy? Certain governments and certain institutions end up receiving so much into their country via remittances, it gives them no incentive to create decent paying jobs within their own country. When 100,000 people send money home, it adds up to a large amount, millions and sometimes billions of dollars for the countries. And that brings a lot of benefit to the country. That does not absolve the government of its responsibility to take care of public goods provision, right? Government's role is to build the roads, light the streets, make the neighborhoods secure, clean the environment, clean the trash. Uh, that's the government's role. Now, you are raising an interesting question. Does this process of, let's say, receiving remittances in excess of 10% of national income year after year, does that lead to some kind of a dependency? And does that kind of uh, lead to a behavior on the part of the government that they don't take care of the economic policies? Suppose we say uh, country X has a dependency on remittances and it is postponing reforms. Okay, so what do we do? Are we going to say, <laughs> let's stop remittances? <laughs> that would hurt so many more people. time migrant workers are sending home cash because their families may not even have a bank account. Now, how was that affected by the lockdowns where people couldn't travel anymore? You couldn't make that visit or you couldn't give it to your friend who was going home, who would live in the same village and who could hand it over to your grandmother. Yes, you are absolutely right. In the immediate aftermath of the crisis, when people couldn't go to money transfer companies to send money home because money transfer companies are not open anyways, and then on top of that, you had this issue that uh, if you send, if you give them cash, they may not want to touch it, 
we were we were not touching anything foreign at that time remember the phenomenon of uh, people hand carrying money to across the border to uh, their countries of origin that was very much prevalent that is very widely prevalent in all economies where you know there is such movement possible south africa to zimbabwe for example or malaysia to indonesia hand carry is very very popular uh, colombian migrants in aruba sending money through pilots who are flying so they would go to the airport uh, and meet the pilot and hand over these envelopes in uh, zimbabwe south africa uh, they would give money to the bus drivers to take money that stopped so there was a huge disruption in remittance flows soon after that digital channels became accessible and uh, you know they stepped up their activities and what we know uh, now from the data from money transfer companies is that many companies that were offering digital services now an interesting point that uh, we made at that time and we continue to make but we have not seen much progress on is the fact that to use digital channels you need to have uh, either a credit card or a debit card uh, and otherwise you have to somehow link it to your bank account which means you have to have a bank account the fact is that most of the migrants do not have bank accounts nearly 2 billion people don't have proper bank accounts a huge number of them are migrants if i want to send money to let's say uh, somebody in 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 the village in my in my country and uh, which is india and if i don't have a bank account if i am one of those people without a bank account i cannot do that why not why can't i do that why is bank account a necessity for sending money and then we go back to the point that there is a regulation that says that there is a huge risk of money laundering and terrorist financing this all came about after september 11 2001 and uh, that is being religiously followed which means that money transfer industry basically says if you have a bank account these risks are low so we are okay with it if you don't have a bank account we don't know what to how to deal with you that is the problem i have for a long time called for a simple reasoning that small remittances are not money laundering the small remittances are just going home to help their own families to do a lot of money laundering using this small remittances of 100 dollars here 200 dollars there is very difficult so we need to have another look at small remittances and uh, sort of begin to think about recognizing that remittances below a certain threshold they are not money laundering what about also the fees that banks charges even when you get into the whole thing the fees that some banks charges are egregious they can be enormous amounts of that just that 100 dollars which is quite unfair to this poor person who's worked hard and is just trying to send money home should governments be actually telling banks you cannot charge that high a fee on such a small amount the cost of sending money you know first we talked about if you don't have a bank account you cannot send money through formal channels so basically you kind of force people to send money through informal channels and that then means money goes underground from the national interest point of view uh, if the money goes through proper formal channels then you can do things with it you can leverage on them to do many good things so we want remittance costs to go down if you are sending money from australia to fiji or new zealand to samoa or japan to vietnam the cost could be 13 14% there are costs like tanzania to uganda is 23% they are neighboring countries and the amount of money you send 100 dollars and you know something like 80 dollars is is finally reaching your family right now that is too high in this time and day when you and i can have this video call for almost no cost we tend to think of migrant workers as you say as people who do the really dirty and tough jobs um in the societies the host countries that they're willing to pay them for but do your statistics also cover people like yourself in other words someone who is got a phd who goes to another country and you may still be sending some money home is that also part of what migrant workers are as well of course of course what we saw during the crisis more than even ever before is that uh, when we began to see the our economic activities and life inching back to normalcy 
some sense of normalcy. You know, the delivery people, um, the store uh, clerks who were in the grocery stores and different stores providing services, the restaurant workers, the doctors, the nurses, uh, the soccer uh, players, whole bunch of them are migrant workers, right? You have the very, very poor people, lower skilled people who are doing a lot of jobs that the native workers in a country, native born workers, they don't want to do. And then there are uh, jobs that migrant workers do that the native workers cannot do. So they fill skill gaps. They bring a lot of good to the uh, countries that host them. And I think if you think about 10 years from now, what would happen to remittances to migration, and if you take it to 30 years, I cannot see any scenario where the flow of migration, the flow of remittances would fall. Income gaps between countries, poor and rich countries, is 1 to 54. It will take 118 years at current growth rates to bridge that gap, meaning that it will never be breached. So then you have about 300, 400 million people who would be joining the working age population in Africa and South Asia and in the world. There will not be that many jobs. So we are looking at several hundred million people looking for jobs and not finding proper jobs. Even if they get jobs, they know that if they migrate, they can increase their salaries, earnings by four, five, 10, 40, 400 times. On top of that, you have the climate change issues and the fragility and conflict. So you are looking at a scenario where migration is going to increase, remittances will increase. We have to accept that fact that these flows will be there. The next question then is that once you accept that, what can we do to make everything better for everyone, enhance the benefits, mitigate the challenges? And that is what I think we should be uh, doing. Migration is a, a good thing overall for everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Rata. Thank you. Much appreciate the opportunity. It has been a great conversation. <laughs>